welcome to the North Witch Podcast with your hosts, Azariel Flame and Sandra Von Holland. In this podcast, we explore all the things that can help us to be better and improve our lives in body, mind, and spirit. Looking at everything from witchcraft, sorcery, woo-woo, spirituality, biohacking, the mundane, and everything in between. We occasionally have on guests from various backgrounds, practices, and philosophies. We welcome everyone from all walks of life, from the left-hand path to the right-hand path, from the medical to the holistic, from the woo-woo to the scientific and everything in between. We have conversations and discussions about our experiences over the years, what works for us, what hasn't worked, and explore new theories and science, trying them out, seeing what works, and debunking what doesn't. Thank you for joining us on this wicked adventure along the crooked path as we adventure into the mysterious and wonderful world and welcome what truly works for us to become better witches, sorcerers, magicians, and our best selves so that we can live our best lives. May these conversations help you to ignite the light within. The views expressed by our guests on this podcast do not necessarily reflect the views of us here at Northwich Magic Co. All of the information shared on this podcast is anecdotal and shared for entertainment purposes only and does not constitute medical or financial advice. Always consult a doctor, physician, or professional in their field before trying any of the things that may be discussed on this channel. Magic and holistic healing should work alongside allopathic care when necessary. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to another exciting episode of the Northwich Podcast. Today, we have on the wonderful Jason Miller, also known as Innominandum. He has devoted 25 years to studying practical magic in its many forms. He has traveled to New Orleans to study hoodoo, to Europe to study witchcraft and ceremonial magic, and to Nepal to study tantra. Miller is a member of the Chthonic Iranian Temple and the Sangreal Sodality, as well as an initiated tantrika in the Nyingma and Bon lineages of Tibet. Miller is the author of the now classic Protection and Reversal Magic, as well as The Sorcerer's Secrets, The Elements of Spellcrafting, Sex, Sorcery, and Spirit, and Financial Sorcery. He also runs the Strategic Sorcery Training Course, Take Back Your Mind Program, and the Sorcery of Hecate Training. And you can find him at strategicsorcery.net or follow him on Instagram at Strategic Sorcery. So how's it going today, Jason? It's going well. Awesome. We are really happy to have you on here. And we were super psyched to get picked to preview your book. It is a masterful piece of art. And I was super excited to see that you went really heavy with three of my favorite spirits, Hecate and Lucifer and St. Cyprian. So, I mean, to me, I know why you would go there, but can you maybe explain why you focused on those three spirits for our listeners? Sure. So, um, Really what I wanted to do was pre when we got into conjurations, right? So in the second half of the book, I talk about evocation, conjuration, and, and whatnot. And I wanted to present how this could be done in a pagan context, in a Christian context, and in a Luciferian context. And... So we focus on St. Cyprian as, uh, but within a, you know, within a Christian context, it's not St. Cyprian. Some people are only comfortable with St. Cyprian as, you know, part of Kimanda or St. Cyprian. Oh, well, he was really, you know, he was really a, a pagan or a Luciferian and, no, no, it's, it's uh, you know, we approach it in a, in a relatively mystic Christian context. And he's the guy, man, when it comes to getting to know spirits and bridging gaps between, uh, bridging between traditions and worldviews. Um, and of course, Lucifer... You know, it's it's just a, a since I've been coming up in the 80s, if you practice magic or witchcraft, sooner or later, somebody's going to accuse you of being a Satanist or a Luciferian. Uh, so whether you like it or not, you're kind of thrown in there. And, and when I was coming up, of course, people would bend over backwards to say, no, 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 no. You know, we don't believe in Satan or Lucifer. And, like people that literally believe in every God spirit ever invented would work with anyone anywhere be like, except Lucifer that we don't, you know, that's, that's not true. 
So nowadays, of course, the devil has had his day. You know, he's he's he helps the LAPD fight crime. He uh, has, you know, sh he's portrayed relatively positively, or at least as an anti-hero on Netflix shows. And um, so there are so many people that they don't approach it from the way that I do necessarily, but that's okay because they can still use the conjurations. But I wanted to give these three different perspectives because it's to show that it's not just a matter of, well, I'm gonna use the same format. I'm just gonna throw different names in, names that I like, right? It actually changes the whole thing. It changes, you know, if you are, let's say, invoking a demon from the Ars Goetia, which is a Christian grimoire. It, it, everyone is, is bound. Those demons are called and bound uh, under the Trinity and, and those powers. And one can even assume that perhaps the seals are developed under that umbrella, that aegis. And so then people want to say, well, I like these spirits and I love these seals. They look awesome, but I don't like all this other stuff. So I'm just going to get rid of it. But then the question is, well, then are those seals still valid, right? Do those seals have a meaning? And what, if so, what meaning do they have? How does the conjuration change? Because if you just drop in Hecate or Lucifer or something, well, you know, Hecate, you're kind of doing uh, a cross tradition thing. You're trying to invoke these demons using Hecate, and she's not completely unknown from ceremonial magic, but it's not exactly the same. And then if you're using, if you're doing it under the power of Lucifer, you're kind of flipping the script. It's no longer this antagonistic. Uh, you know, I, I'm for the enemy and I'm under the power of God. I'm calling you bad guys. Now it's sort of like, you know, you're, you're kind of being, forgive me, like the, the ultimate magical Karen. Like, I want to talk to your manager. I, I'm, I'm talking to Lucifer and Lucifer is going to get you to, to do what I want. So the dynamics change when you when you flip these powers but people don't generally think about that so i wanted to do something that got people thinking about that fantastic that's a great way to answer that i love that so I, as i was reading through it you know you have all of these awesome weight conjurations that are in there and everything and it's really interesting to see that you're kind of pushing the softer side of conjuration rather than instead of doing you know the binding under oath and adjuring by oath and that kind of thing so um i know a lot of our listeners do come from kind of that solomonic background and they would you know look at that and go oh my god what are you gonna do if you don't have your protective seals and if you don't summon the angels so what is your perspective on that and why do you approach it from you know the nicer side rather than the I'm gonna bind you with chains side. Well, see, no, I have I have in there the 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 forced conjurations, right? Like, so there's a chapter in there about hey, this is how you do this through invitation, through 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 come on over. Here's an invite. Might even look the same. Circle, altar, incense, and and but your conjurations are an invitation right? But there is also in the book, the forced conjurations to say, get here, you are being forced. You, you absolutely must do this under these powers. You got to have both, right? But the idea of starting that way, that's one of those things that I've just learned over time. It's just not the best way to go. And Sure, it's traditional, but in what area, you know, like treating blood disease with leeches is traditional too, but we, we somehow feel okay with going like, well, you know, 
Like we've moved on. Um, and so there's nothing wrong in my mind with having that open invitation, that friendly conjuration, as long as you have the ability to exercise should you need to. So in a way, the Solomonic magicians are right. You need to have the, that ability. So for instance, let's just imagine that you or, or any listeners out there or viewers, I don't know if this is video or audio, or, but um, let's just imagine that you move to a new place, right? And you wanna meet the neighbors. Well, what do you do? Do you go and like get a writ from the town that they have to let you in their house or, you know, or do you, you know, maybe you hold a party, you give offerings, right? So you have, you, you invite everybody over to a party, but you don't know these people. So if you invite everybody over for the party, you also have to know that you can call 911 should you need to. Maybe it's good to have a, a friend that has the capability to bounce somebody out on their ass, right? Um, I'm kind of a, I'm not a tough guy, but I'm kind of a big guy. So I've been occasionally called to boot somebody out on their ass. And, um, but so you need to have that. You need to walk softly and carry a big stick as, as uh, Teddy Roosevelt said. If you don't have the stick and all you are is, well, accept these offerings and please help me, help me, help me. That's not really magic. You're just asking for trouble. But it's also asking for trouble if upon first introduction, I pull out a knife, put it to your throat and I'm like, Listen, fucker, you better do what I say. Sorry, I'm probably not allowed to curse, but... Oh, go ahead. We have an explicit uh, you know, channel. <laughs> like, you, you know, you will do what I say. That's, that's not going to necessarily give you the best result either. So you have to have the carrot and the stick. You have to have all the tools at your disposal and know when to use them when. And if you don't know for sure when to use them, then yeah, start out friendly and escalate should you need to. And it also then becomes a matter of, do you really need to? There's so many spirits out there, so many ways to skin a cat. You get an uncooperative spirit. What do you do with people? You go on, you find somebody else. You don't, you don't just bang your head against a wall like this is the only possibility. You, you find somebody else. But if somebody is messing with you or if it's somebody at work that you have to deal with and you can't just tell them to kiss off, I'll work with somebody else, then you take more wrathful methods. I'm, I'm a fan of all the methods. Fantastic. Very well said. Oh, I see you had a question there, Ma. You can jump in. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, I was, I was studying you today because I had to take the time to do that. So with your book, it was, I really liked that it was, uh, that it, it's not all about the big guys. I like that you said, work with who's local there too. Like you don't yeah. always have to call in the big guys, which, you know, sometimes when you it depends who you're listening to and they're like oh it's all about the big guys so it's i really enjoy that you kind of tame it down and make it more real and really and usable for more people there there is an enormous amount of sorcery that i do that gets done with uh local spirits uh, especially if they're local matters right uh, so local spirits that they're not in a book or perhaps they're spirits of the dead. Or if you've got, you know, I, I, there's a, a famous spiritualist that lived not far from here and her grave is not far from here. And she's excellent at, in, at creating more introductions to other local spirits. 
uh, when I lived in the Pine Barrens of New Jersey, there was the spirit of a witch that was similar. Um, I write about her in the book. But you know, the funny thing is that even when people think that they've called in the big guns, very often what they're really getting is a local spirit. People forget these, you know, demons have legions working for them and angels have choirs and things. And so you get what I call, and, and you know, I mean, the Greeks wrote about this too, that, that local spirits will, will sometimes stand in for these, the big guys, the big guns. Um, and so this is what I call the mall Santa phenomenon, right? Uh, if you're, you know, you get to a certain age as a kid and you realize that the guy at the mall is not Santa, right? Like Santa doesn't hang out at your specific local mall and the one at the other mall looks a little different. And so you don't have to be, you, kids figure this out like in kindergarten. But of course, because Santa is real, they know that that's, it's not evidence that there is no Santa. They know that that's just right. an employee. That's a guy pretending to be Santa. So just like in Home Alone, uh, you go up, you tell the guy like, look, I know you're not Santa, but when you report to him, tell them that I want, you know, X. Right. So very often it's actually a local spirit that's doing the, the work anyway. Yeah, I really like that. So that leads into actually one of the questions that I had for you. And that's, uh, you know, you don't always have to do a full evocation, as you say in the book. Um, and sometimes you, the manifestations of resonance are, you know, more than what you need. Did you want to maybe touch base on what that means and why that maybe works? Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's interesting because take a look at folk magic, right? Take a look at any kind of folk magic. Um, you're, you're manipulating stuff, usually. Uh, there's a bath, there's a candle, there's, uh, you know, you're taking herbs or packets of, of, of uh, links and moving them together or pulling them apart or burning them or whatever it is, this, this sympathetic magic. And, but you're also usually praying, right? Or, or calling upon a spirit. Uh, so maybe it's a psalm, but if you look, take a look at the uh, Joseph Peterson's translation of that Venetian uh, grimoire. I can't remember the name that he published it under now, but it's, it's all spirits from the grimoire verum, but there are spells associated with them, right? Like you take Clownic seal and you make fake coins with it, like paper coins that you uh, fill something up with. And so do you need Clownek to be fully present and evoked in full visible appearance to say, can you do this? And he, for him to say, yeah, sure. Um, no, you don't. What you need is resonance. So in a one and done spell, you've got, you call, you, you do the call, you do the invocation. You don't necessarily need that spirit to appear and communicate to you. You are doing something and you want something done or you want a result to happen. And so you, you become resonant with that spirit, right? You don't need to like full HD, 4K, you know, can this happen? In fact, that's kind of a pain in the butt, right? And, and you guys probably know this, and, and I know this, like there are certain things that just happen, like people sign up for things, and then there's like an automatic process. But if somebody signs up, comes to me and says like, I am now signing up for your thing, are you gonna give me the thing? And I'm like, yeah, it's automatic. Just like <laughs> leave me the F alone. It just like you click it and it happens. I don't actually need to say yes. But so, you know, it's the same thing with spirits. And then on a longer term basis, this is why I like 
uh, why I like regular practice, why I stress a regular practice, because then it builds this long-term resonance where you're living that, that, that life. You're, you're living that resonance of having a Hecatean practice or being resonant with those uh, Christian diabolistic powers uh, through your regular work. And what that does is it just increases the resonance. It makes you part of the, the, the divine machinery so that when you call upon those powers, they listen. We're always worried about uh, whether we can see a spirit, but very few people ever ask, like, can the spirit see me? Can the spirit sense me? Well, regular practice over time is a way to get that to happen. And, you know, if you don't have that, then there are other ways to, do, to build up to something. So, for instance, the, the weeks of fasting and purification and prayer before an evocation and these kinds of things, that, that all builds resonance. But if you have a regular practice that you do every day, then I'm not saying that it's worthless or you don't need to do it or that it's not helpful, but you know, you can, you, you might be able to get away without it. Whereas somebody who doesn't have any kind of regular practice might not. Absolutely. I would, I would totally agree with you on that. <laughs> in, in my opinion, the resonance aspect of, of magic, the, the having the attention and the, the, the resonance with that power that you're calling upon for a sorcerer, for a witch, it's actually, it's more important than having the visions and the appearance and the spirits popping up to say, yes, no, maybe, you know, this sort of dial a deity thing. This is especially true when it comes to gods and things where people are just obsessed with like, I want this vision. I want a vision. I want I want to see, I want to hear. And it's sort of like, yeah, you know, I mean, we've got these communities where on one side, there's people who can do great magic. Like pe students in the Hecate course will tell me like, all the magic is coming and my life is changing and I actually feel myself becoming like better, clearer and, and getting the things that I want um, in life and as a person. But I want to have this experience of just seeing Hecate and having her say hi. And, and I'm kind of like, okay, because then on the other side of the Facebook group, you've got people that are like, you know, I just started the course today. I said one mantra of Eo Heka Eo Ho, and then she appeared and put a crown on my head and then took me to Narnia. And then, we, you know, and it's sort of like, okay, so you had this phantasmagoric trip. And, but when you look at it, there's like, what, what is really of value there? Now those are extremes. Most people operate in the middle, but. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's one thing that you do touch on in the book that I found rather fascinating and probably would have been helpful, you know, 15 years ago, had it been out for people to realize that, Hey, you know, if I can't see everything, it's not a big deal. The magic can still work. The spirit can still hear me. So um, what are some of the most important things for you then? Because you do touch on, you know, it, you have the people, like you said, that, you know, they're always on Facebook and, you know, Lucifer sat me on a throne and he crowned me and now I'm king of hell. And then you have the other people that see absolutely nothing. And they're getting totally disparaged by these people that are you know, having these great, amazing visions. And so what are the most important things to you? And you explain them in the book, but for our viewers and listeners that can help them to achieve a successful magic, what if they're not getting these visions? You know, the, there are, so the first, there are levels to, to, to answering the question. And the first thing is a frame, like, 
don't be jealous of those people who have these phantasmagoric joy rides because again when you look what when you look at what it yields as far as things that are actionable as far as things that are meaningful as far as things that um give any kind of verifiable information right there's not a lot there there's just there's not a ton so people who have that and i'm one of those people by the way i'm i'm one of these like if i go to an open circle and somebody does some really awful like ridiculous al manning-esque chant i'll get something <laughs> But it's not necessarily going to have any worth. So I'm one of those people that has to say, okay, discernment time. Like, what is really, is there anything here? What is the perception projection ratio? Like, what am I projecting onto this experience versus what am I genuinely perceiving? And anyone who thinks that they've, perceived a subtle being with 100% accuracy is fooling themselves. We don't even perceive physical people with 100% accuracy. This conversation, all three of us are projecting onto it. And the moment it's over, we will have a slightly different you know, in, interpretation and even here necessarily, like different inflections that give meaning to different things. So if this is true of people, how much more true is it of subtle beings, right? So that idea that like, this is the ideal and these people suck, get rid of that. Um, and then the, the next biggest thing people can do is nothing. And I mean, do nothing. Schedule time to do nothing. Um, no, don't, this isn't meditation. Meditation is a different skill. Meditation will help with discernment. In meditation, you're focused on the breath. Thought comes and distracts. You return to the breath. It's great. You're getting to recognize the nature of your own mind. It's magnificent. People who have these visions, meditation, that will help you with discernment. You'll know the substance of your own thoughts versus, you know, maybe a, a spirit. But if you want to open up, you need idle time. You need nothing time. You need time for connections. And in 2007, we took the last little scrap of time in our lives and shot it dead with an iPhone. <laughs> and so we don't even like stand in line or wait for the doctor anymore with idle time. We just like instantly were. So just like, you know, 150 years ago, people didn't have to worry about getting on a treadmill and running or everybody just had to walk, right? Like you, you had to walk places. There was no other way around. And then now we drive, we sit for work, we sit in the car, we sit all the time. So we start to think, oh, I don't have this anymore. I need to make time for it. Well, idle time, idle time, your brain makes connections. If you read a dozen books, and you don't have any time in between them to build connections, you're actually cheating yourself out of one of the most important parts of reading those books. So idle time, just do nothing, not a damn thing. And if you can spend that in nature, if you can spend that in quiet places or in spiritual places, in, in haunted places, all the better. So that's another one. There are exercises, the, the pillar and spheres in the uh, Sorcerer's Secrets. That's essentially a sublimation, right? So it's an energetic, right? That will, and I include it in this book too, that will help make you, your perceptions more subtle. There are little tricks of perception uh, that, that I give in the book. Well, for instance, 
anyone watching this can do it right now. You can just look in front of you, like whatever you see. Right now, I've got a monitor and a lamp and blinds and a window. But if I look at this and I just settle my mind, and I imagine that it's all happening on a giant 4K TV screen that I, I can't even see the edges of it. It's so big. All of this in front of me is two dimensional. It's like it's on a, it's just projected on a screen. Like, you know, in a play, you've got a couple pieces of set and then they paint the background to look like, you know, it goes off into the, the yellow brick road goes off into the distance. It's like that. You, you take something that actually is three dimensional just in your head, collapse it down to two dimensions and then reach out with your mind reach out with reach out with your feelings luke <laughs> um which is actually not bad advice like if you want something from star wars to to bring into magic reaching out with your feelings is actually uh, a pretty good way to put it but reach out beyond that screen what's on the other side of that screen it's a trick of the mind what are you doing you're taking your ordinary perception of three dimensions and collapsing it down to two, which creates a vacuum that can then be filled with things we don't easily perceive. And so it's a trick. But if you, if you spend that idle time, if you do those energetic exercises and you learn a few little tricks like this, all but, but really like people, and the other thing too, the last little bit of advice for the head blind or the people that are so convinced that they can't see a spirit is you people get so hopped up on the idea that they need to see a spirit and that when the spirit shows up, they start to go, well, maybe that's just my imagination, right? Like, it's kind of like if, if you cheats if you're trying to learn to ride a surfboard and you're standing up on the board and then you're like well wait let me am i standing the right way and look you're you're in the water right or if you're on a bike and your your parent lets you go as you start coasting and you're balancing the moment you go like am i doing this right you fall well what happens is is people they start to perceive something and then they start to go, well, is this fantasy? It's probably fantasy. And what they're doing is they're actually telling like there's that spirit that's reaching out. They're saying, yeah, but that's not like it is in the movies. So it's probably not real. Right. And so they're not willing to take the baby steps, engage the fantasy a little bit while it's happening afterwards then criticize it tear it apart look for what's meaningful and actionable but while it's happening roll with it just roll with it while it's happening if it if you wind up engaging in a little bit of fantasy so be it worry about it after the fact this happens with astral projection too right like people start to feel like they're out of their body and then they'll think can i feel my body and then of course because they're not dead <laughs> they can in fact feel their body but they've just killed their astral projection experience so those are my you know short try this <laughs> I think just that advice alone will definitely get people well on their way to getting past the, oh my God, I'm not as good as so-and-so on Facebook. <laughs> Stop compare, compare-itis, first off, right? And take the time. That's so huge and, that, and huge in our time right now. We just, we, like you say, we don't even stand in, in line anymore and have idle thoughts. We don't, it's, we're, we don't give ourselves permission to take that time. Like, no. why do we have to be plugged in while we're on the treadmill? Why can't we be on the treadmill with ourselves? It's, it's really, it's, it's 
it's so incredibly important to have these this vital time. And, you know, anyone that's doubting that, like, I don't know, if you've mowed the lawn, chances are you suddenly stop and you think, man, I got to write this down because I have this thought or something else where you can't do like you can't do anything else. Maybe you're in the car and somebody else is listening to music that you're not interested in. And all of a sudden these these thoughts bubble up. Right. It's not meditation. It's it's just idle time. But without that, without those gaps, without that silence, without that wandering mind, um, you don't develop the, the skill set uh, to perceive m- even ordinary reality, much less subtle reality. I think maybe that's why the shower is such a good spot. Because we don't, it is just us and our thoughts in the shower. And I think that's, it's such a powerful place for downloads. Do you find yep. that as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, uh, the the famous Dzogchen Lama Namkai Norbu, you, I never saw it, but supposedly there he wrote a practice like for hot tubs, <laughs> like because you're in the hot tub and it's really comfortable, but you know it's not like you can bring a whole lot into the hot tub, so it's a good place to sit and contemplate, Let's see what comes. <laughs> So another thing that you touch on on the book that, you know, uh, I find is a really cool thing that not a lot of people talk about is authority. So what are the different types of authority and why do they matter? Oh, man. See, the problem with doing like a show like this after the book is like I finished the book months ago. (laughs) (laughs) And the last thing I want to see, like across my desk is the damn book. So, um, you know, there are all kind. there are multiple different ways that in the past that I have broken up the idea of authority, like into different parameters. Because when you're a teacher, of course, you do these things like, okay, I'm going to divide things up into a seven layered world. And then I'm going to, maybe I'll break it up into three to make it simpler like this. But, you know, in general, there are, um, the there's invested authority, right? So you've got the authority that, and I forget what I call it in the book. Forgive me. I, I should probably open up the table of contents um that's all fact, good. let me let me do that hold on i have a pdf i don't even have the book yet um but uh so let's see authority what kinds of authorities oh my goodness so many were authority words i'm like doing a control f in my own book how sad is this <laughs> um, great so you know it's uh so apparently there's chapter so you know you've got inve- uh invested authority although I, I i just stopped looking at the book um or conferred authority i think is what i call it where you you're a member of a group so an ordination um as a as a priest gives you a certain conferred authority um initiation as a tantric gives you a certain conferred authority initiation into different magical orders gives you a certain conferred authority um there are certain spirits that uh, that are say protectors or specific to those groups that might only be answer to people with that authority but then there's a certain degree to which that authority um would be recognized even outside that right and then you have invoked authority where at the beginning of a ritual for instance people um it, it when crowley 
uh, and Mathers published their Ars Goetia, it had the bornless one ahead of it, right? So you've got this ritual where I am Moses, your prophet, who's transmitted the mysteries by uh, uh, celebrated by Israel. And then you're saying, you know, hear me and make all spirits subject unto me so that every spirit of the firmament and of the ether, it's, it's invoked authority. So no one conferred it upon you. You are invoking it. You're naming those beings or even taking the role of those beings. In Tantra, they do a lot, you do a lot of visualization. So you see yourself as, say, Vajrakilaya. And you then invoke Vajrakilaya. And so his nature. Uh, you're, you've visualized yourself and you've dissolved your own self-perception and you've arisen as Vajrakalaya and then you've invoked it to make it inseparable and you've done mantras to build resonance, right? And then and only then can you invoke the Dharmapalas who are otherwise really wild spirits that, that might, um, you know, act like soccer hooligans in your house if you were to just invoke them as... Sandra or Jason. Um, so that's invoked authority. And then there's earned authority, right? The, the authority that comes from your own spirit, the authority that comes from you developing a certain level of realization, a certain level of perception, and a certain level of power that is respected in and of itself. So instead of either getting conferred the power of Padmasambhava or St. Cyprian or Christ, or invoking uh, and, and constraining or exercising those beings under those names to say by the name of you know, this being and that being, well, then you become a being based upon your own authority who is able to do that um it's it's the major you know the first time that that christ gets in trouble in the bible with the authorities it's because he's performing exorcisms without invoking god and they accuse him well if you're not invoking god you must be invoking Beelzebub. and he's not he's doing it on his own authority now of course from a Christian perspective is because he is God. So, but, you know, from another perspective, it is perhaps his earned authority. So these are different ways of, of establishing authority that you are a person who is worth listening to, that you are a person whose call should be answered. Um, you know, there are others, there are protocols that people follow. And then they, you know, they perform the protocols and sometimes spirits have pledged to, to answer beings who have followed those protocols. Totally fair. Kind of like the pentacles of Solomon. If you own the pentacle, you own those spirits. <laughs> All right. So you actually, uh, you know, when we look at the grimoires, the, the Ars Goetia and, you know, the other books of the Lemageton and whatever, lots of them don't include all of the spirits. And so the four kings aren't really mentioned the way that they should be in them. So I found it really cool and interesting that you decided to go with the four kings. So who are the four kings and why did you pick them for the invocations in the book? Well, you know, the four kings are, they're sometimes called the four demon kings. I don't view them as demon kings or angel kings. I view them as, it's kind of like St. Cyprian. They, they are spirits, they are liminal spirits. They can manage the contact between the Chthonos and the Oranos, between the underworld and the heavens. And, uh, also can call beings to wherever you are because they are also the kings of those directions. And when calling, you know, they, they are, of 
course, so prevalent in so many grimoires. And you're right, they're not listed in the Ars Goetia, and some people feel they should be. Um, but the the thing about the about conjurations that happened when these books were written uh, between, you know, it, during the Renaissance and, and after versus the very, very modern grimoire revival is that it was not uncommon for conjurers. And, and Jake Stratton Kent writes about this and I, I quote him in the book and I can't remember the conjurer's name now, but he gives a recording of a conjuration that happened in Rome and they brought a whole stack of books in, right? Like we'll use this circle and this conjuration and this, um, you know, if this one doesn't work, then that one will work. And if you look at exorcisms, same thing. You're, you're throwing the book at these demons, right? Why are there so many names into an, in, in, a, in an exorcism or for that matter, in an evocation? Because you never know which one is gonna like work, right? You know, like that spirit might be resonant with the name Theotokos or, or uh, you know, uh, Sabo. Um, and then other names are not as meaningful. So there's a whole host of different ways that you can approach it. But the four kings have proven to me to be universally useful in almost any context. And so I wanted to uh, provide them for, for folks doing either Christian or Luciferian conjurations uh, in the book because they would they work with either way fantastic all right did you have any other loaded questions there ma i see you just kind of soaking it up here <laughs> <laughs> of course i'm like damn i didn't get to that part in the book <laughs> you caught me <laughs> that's okay because clearly i don't even remember some of what's in the book <laughs> so that's fair <laughs> Right. What other questions do you have there? Oh, I've got lots here. I was just wondering what, what you had based on what you had read. No, I'm just, uh, we are we are students of you, Jason. We're oh, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I really like that you make it, you take out the scary and the too complex out of it. And just, I really like that. The, just live it kind of thing yeah you know there's there is um i mean don't get me wrong i i love the scholars and, and i love um i love some of the intellectual debates around it and i'll get involved in those sometimes right but it's not magic itself is not a game of being the smartest most intellectual number cruncher right uh in the room and so it's so i'm able to do it because otherwise i would not <laughs> 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 and so, but, you know, in, and in practice, I'm all about the practice. I'm all about like magic hitting the road and making real change. And the biggest things that have made, let magic make the biggest difference in my life have been honestly treating it as mechanically as possible. Like going, okay, well, you know, my worldview is such and my experience is such that I can't ignore magic. I, I don't, it's proven itself to me that it exists. And I have this magic shaped hole in my soul that, that drives me and calls me towards it, right? Um, 
But when it comes down to actually making it work and doing things that matter with it, once I accept that and then say, all right, and given that, I'm going to look at it as a real thing that more or less works how other real things work. And this winds up setting me on a different path than some of the ways that other people look at it and some of the ways that even traditions look at it, even all traditions look at it. Um, and, and so be it. Exactly. It's such a great, a, a different perspective on things that you're getting. And it's, I'm enjoying it. So well, I'm glad. Thank you. Tell us a day in the life of Jason. Tell us that. Oh, goodness. Um, you know, it, it would not be super exciting for most people. I, I a day in the life of Jason. Uh, typically, I wake up at about 6 a.m., a uh, little bit before, and there's just a few, there's, there's like a short moment and, and literally moments of contemplation. I, I wake up and, and uh, I breathe and I sound the word ah, and I take a moment uh, to just apprehend reality as it is in, in, without any, uh, without laying on anything, what, what's called rigpa, natural awareness, right? Primordial awareness. Yeah. And then uh, I will, st I, I, I am in the dead sorcerer society. So I will, you know, uh, as we all are. So there's a, the Lord's prayer is involved and the seven line prayer to Padmasambhava is in, involved every day. And, but in, in my mind, Jesus and Padmasambhava are, you know, whether they're Buddhas or gods, they're also dead sorcerers. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so uh, prayers to St. Cyprian and uh, chants to Hecate and uh, these kinds of things happen throughout the day, um, but they don't all happen as soon as I wake up. That might be ideal. But I've also got two kids. So after just a, a couple prayers, then I head down and I, you know, I, I make sure my daughter is up and I make sure my son is up and I start my coffee and I make breakfast. And uh, then, you know, after a little while, my wife comes down and then I go back up to get dressed and do a little more, just a few more minutes of, of meditation uh, I live in the sticks in, in the mountains, so I do a little sky gazing. Uh, oh then I take the kids to their bus stop since, you know, also in the sticks, we don't just, can't just walk to the bus stop. We actually have to drive to the bus stop. Um, and then I head into the office and I do some real, you know, do some work uh, as far as, sitting and meditating properly and, and uh, doing my, you know, Hecate invocations, or if I'm focused somewhere else, maybe that'll be the first thing I do. And then I sit at my desk and I get to work work on my courses and questions and writings and things. And, you know, little bits and bobs throughout the day where life and magic are integrated, offerings, that get brought outside every day, even in the cold. So that's awesome. I, I think that's really cool to hear about your day too, because I think a lot of people that read your books or any magic book for that matter, you know, they kind of think that the author is some kind of bodhisattva that just sits there and meditates all day and does magic all day, all night. And you know, that you really actually have a life and you're able to be a successful sorcerer with maintaining you know a family life and some semblance of normalty right i i am um and you know the 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 but you know on the other on the flip side of it you do have to make time for the magic uh, so there are certainly times where 
um, I'll get involved in a little too much TV watching or I'll get involved <laughs> in a little too much uh, going out or, or a little too much Facebook or, or something like that. And the scroll catches you. Oh. And, yeah, of course. <laughs> of course. That's great um, to hear. And so, you know, I, I'll under, you know, I'll hit that and then realize, oh, well, you know, that's why I don't have this time to do this ritual that I wanted to do, or, you know, it might not even be magic. It might be exercise, it might, you know, so maybe some yoga that I wanted to do, or um, could be just, you know, lunch with my wife. So, you know, I think every magician, every occultist, every sorcerer, witch, they do have to look at their life and kind of say, where is the magic going to go? Not the reading about magic, not the arguing about magic on social media, the actual performance of magic. Where is it going to go? Um in my life, there's daily practices that I do every day, and these can be condensed really small, or they can be expanded if I have the time. But then beyond that, there's also special operations that you'll want to do, that you'll want to make time for, just like you make time for a movie. And so if people are just all caught up on every single streaming show and they have kids and a spouse and and everything else i'm sort of like where do you do the magic like where does that fit in <laughs> stuff for sure well it doesn't like we talked in the beginning there is zero idle time in there so and zero practice time so what are you actually getting and then the comparitis comes in right because they're those are probably the people that are comparing to those that are getting great visions and great messages but we can't really compare, can we? Because those that are getting the visions, and maybe not the extremists that have the whole big <laughs> science stories, but you know, those that are doing it are, are obviously doing it. Yeah. So you can't compare their chapter nine to the first chapter when you haven't even stopped the Facebook scroll, really. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. So Jason, I thought it would be kind of cool because anyone who has taken your courses know that you are a big proponent of Q and A's and a lot of your students tend to get as much, if not more out of the Q and A's as they do out of the actual lessons. So I allowed our patrons to ask a few questions. So if you're okay with that, I thought it would be a really cool way to wrap this up and stick to the Jason Miller brand. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. So one of the first questions we've got here, this is actually a two-parter, so I'll break it up for you. Um, the first part of his question is, what are your opinions on ancestral energy alignments and are they important in the work? Um, so I have, like so many other things, I don't drift to the extremes on this. Um, there are some people who feel very strongly that it's all about the ancestors, uh, that, that that's where you start with your ancestors. Typically people from uh, any kind of spiritualist or, or uh, African traditional religion, you know, they, they start with the ancestors, even more important than the Loa, more important than the Orisha, start with the ancestors. But that doesn't necessarily hold true across the board. So I'm not, uh, I don't have an ancestor altar. I have a few tokens from, from ancestors throughout the house. Uh, my wife actually just got a big canvas made of uh, a picture of my grandmother in, in jail. Um, <laughs> behind bars. She's posing with a bunch of her friends with alcohol. <laughs> So she wasn't actually arrested. Uh, I think her heart would have stopped had she been. But um, so, you know, it's not that, that this the ancestors aren't important, but I don't do a ton of, you know, like got to have the ancestor work, got to consult the ancestors, got to get their opinion on everything. And 
but on the other hand, there are people who are sort of deeply avoiding their ancestors. Like, you know, maybe the, you know, well, my ancestors were not pro LGBT, which is, unless they were LGBT, there's a very good chance if, you know, you go back further than, you know, a generation that that was the case. Um, maybe they were racist. Maybe they owned other people, which is horrific and, and was horrific at the time. People act like, you know, uh, well, it was normal. Well, it was normal, but it was also known to be horrific at the time. In the same way that, you know, we do all kinds of things that are horrific now that are normal. But um, so, but it, you can't avoid it. Like pretending it's not there doesn't really help you either because your body, like it or not, is made from the DNA of your parents and their parents and, and their parents before them. So it all, your body, if nothing else, carries your ancestral load to a certain extent. And so some amount of offering, some amount of acknowledgement is helpful. But people sometimes mistake the role of offering. They hear offering and they think, if I'm offering to the ancestors, I'm doing something nice for them because I want to get close. But that's not what offerings are for all the time. In fact, the oldest layer of offerings to spirits is really take this and leave me alone. <laughs> like take this and don't flood my fields. Take this and don't burn my house down. <laughs> like take this and don't let us get sick. Um, that's offering as well. So you can give an offering to your ancestors to tell them, shut the hell up. I'm not about what you were about. I am making a break. And so everybody has to choose the level of involvement with their ancestors. No, you should not let anybody tell you you need to, absolutely, and there is no other way to do magic, nor should you let people tell you that you shouldn't deal with your ancestors because everybody in the past was horrible and why would you want you know to deal with people that were horrible absolutely and that kind of plays really good into the second part of this question which is what is the best way to deal with adversarial ancestral energies and i think they're asking about you know kind of those negative ancestors that we don't really want to deal with yeah you know um the best way to deal with it, uh, you know, I mean, there magically, the best way to deal with it is to make an offering and say, you know, okay, you're you're there, um, but hang in the back, hang in the background, if that's if you don't want to hear from them. Um, take this offering and be silent. Um, or, you know, I mean, there, you can do magic without working with the ancestors at all. And so that's another tactic you can take. Um, if you wanted to build understanding and relationship and things like this, uh, you know, there are different mental frameworks that you can sort of thought experiments that you can do to place yourself in someone else's place. So for instance, uh, you know, uh, I'm a white guy and I'm married to a black woman. The ideas of social justice and, and, and the black experience are really, really important to my life and my world. Um, none of my ancestors, I think, own slaves, but I was of the color <laughs> you know, like, so I have to look at that and say, okay, you know, horrible views, horrible things sewn into this, uh, into this past, things that were 
crazy normal, even though, as I said, they knew they were horrible. And thank God that I'm not like that today, right? Except I am like that today. And, uh, you know, I've got a cell phone here that I pick up every day. You guys do too, I'm assuming, right? You have a smartphone, right? Of course. Uh, so every day, you want to talk about a spiritual practice. Every day I pick up my smartphone and I think about a story I read about a nine-year-old boy who works in the cobalt mines in the, the DRC. And it's essentially slavery. It's, I mean, it's child slavery is what it boils down to. And I think about people in China that have secreted notes away in products to basically say, help us. And then probably like you as well, I think about that and then I turn my phone on and I play Wordle and get on Facebook and argue about nonsense. And so if I can do that, I can look at my ancestors and say, yeah, that was horrible. And I want no part of that. And I'm, I pray that a hundred years from now, my descendants think I would never allow a nine-year-old to work in cobalt mines just so I could have a goddamn smartphone. I, and I pray that they look at us and say, wow, what, what horrors that they just seemed okay with. And that's the world. Yep. <laughs> that is some great advice there. So we have another question here, and this listener says, I have been getting into my spirituality and starting to practice a little bit of magic, but I have been kind of scared to begin working with spirits because of all of the stories that I hear where if I can't maintain my offerings or if I upset the spirits that I will have some misfortune come upon me. What is your advice for getting started with working with spirits and how do I stop this from happening or prevent it from affecting me? Yeah. So, um, First things first, grab, uh, if you haven't read Consorting with Spirits, grab Protection and Reversal Magic first. In, in the new book, it actually says, don't make this your first book. Like, you know, <laughs> because I don't give any protection chapter in it at all. I wrote a whole book on Protection and Reversal Magic. So a so chapter there first. on it, really, right? <laughs> Like a chapter just doesn't do the trick. Um, but the other thing is there is a growing, like this idea of like, the, if I upset the spirits, my life will be ruined is growing. It's everywhere. And I've, you know, like coming up, this was never the idea in the occult community, but it, it's everywhere now. And so there are things I wanted to say. So let me, what's, what's the reader's name? Do we know? Uh, this one was just anonymously sent in. So All right. I... Anonymous. <laughs> Number one, anonymous. You know that magic doesn't work like, it, like Dungeons and Dragons, right? Or Harry Potter. You can't zap fireballs across the room. It also doesn't work like it works in a horror movie where the grimoire will call the spirit, but not get rid of the spirit, right? It doesn't make any sense. If the magic works well enough to call the spirit, it also works well enough to dismiss the spirit. Um, so have a, you know, don't be programmed by horror movie thinking any more than you're programmed by Harry Potter or Dungeon Dragons thinking. It doesn't work that way. I know people in their 80s and 90s who've been summoning angels and making packs with demons and offerings to local spirits and, and traipsing about graveyards their whole life, and they're fine. <laughs> Does this mean nothing bad can happen? No, 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 bad things can happen. Just like when you get in behind the wheel of a car, you 
can get into a car accident. Even if you drive perfectly, you can get into a car accident. You can die every time you get into a car. But we get into a car anyway because we think about, well, the risk is, eh, the reward is, eh, and so I'm going to go for it. Well, if you feel magic's call, that's kind of the thing, right? You want to learn to you want to learn to drive. You want to wear a seatbelt. If you're going to drive fast, then you want to have a roll cage and a helmet. Um, but so it is with magic, right? You're, you're going to take steps to protect yourself that are commensurate with the risks you're taking. Now, the other part of this is if you are dealing with spirits that you think that you have any inclination are such petulant asshats that if you miss an offering or you get sick and you don't pray right or you mispronounce a word that they are going to lash back at you why are you doing that like why are you letting these beings into your life at all if this is what you think like what are the immense benefits that you think like if you go to the pagan convention and you look around are people like well you know marbus is really awful to deal with but he gave me a billion dollars so you know it's worth it in the end no of course not and you don't deal with people you don't let you don't deal with people like this that you don't have to deal with maybe there's family members and co-workers that you feel like you have to deal with but here's the thing, unless you, you know, I'm willing to bet that you're probably not from a family that's forcing you to do magic. <laughs> like, like, so like you don't have, if you're afraid of Hecate and you think that she's going to, you know, just destroy your life should you miss an offering day on the dark moon i wouldn't bother with hecate if that's how she was like seriously i love hecate but i would never mess with a with a petulant jackass like that and thank god she's not like that nor are most spirits are some yes some are and you tell those spirits to kiss off that you don't want them in your life. Maintain sovereignty over your life. Um, but people get stupid when they start getting involved in spirits. They forget all the rules that they have for work for people. Like with people, they have boundaries and expectations and uh, and, and, and politeness. And once somebody says spirit, it all goes out the window. And that's not good. Just generally apply a lot of what you apply with other people to spirits and you'll be fine. That's great. <laughs> Just don't let them in. Bye. Well, yeah, if you if that's what your position is, like if you mm -hmm. think spirits are just going to wreck your life and that's, you know, and this is again, this is people say blame TikTok a lot, but this is what happens when every like there's too much too much noise, not enough signal, right? There's so much noise out there. And the idea that spirits are causing you problems is actually a really attractive fantasy. Now, this isn't to say it doesn't happen. It does happen. Magical attacks happen, psychic attacks happen, spiritual issues happen. These are all real. But the amount of people lately coming forth and just basing their whole life on this, it, it's a very attractive fantasy because it does two things. It, on the one hand, it makes you extremely important. I am so important that this God 
is spending time and energy to mess with me. That this, that this, this high angel, this famous being is angry with me. I must be really important. And it also alleviates you of any responsibility because what can I do? I'm cursed. I'm being messed with. So that's a very attractive position for useless people to put themselves in. They are both important and helpless at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. I totally would agree with that. All right. We've gone a little bit over your time here, Jason. We have two more questions. Do you have time for them or would you like? I have time. time. All right. That's fantastic. So I'm going to leave the best one for last, but I've got one here from Tyrone that says, how rampant is energy vampirism in the magical community? And since we're talking about consorting with spirits, is it something we should be worried about with spirits? It's something that you should be aware of and, and guard against with spirits and with people. Um, because people are spirits, just inhabiting bodies. Um, and so, but how rampant isn't, it's not rampant, it, at least in a conscious way where people are like, you know, where, where I'm sitting here and I'm tired or, you know, I want to do magic later. And suddenly I'm like, you know, Sandra looks like she's just tasty and glowing with power. I'm going <laughs> to you know, say like suck her energy through, you know, but uh, as far as like energy vampires, as far as like people wasting your time, that's rampant for sure. Uh, and you're, you're, you, we're all our own worst energy vampire when it comes to that. I, I am no different than anybody else there. The amount of like, you know, pointless political, I mean, goodness, we all just got through a week where people like raged and unfriended each other over a celebrity slapping another celebrity, right? <laughs> like we all just drew our own energy out over this. Um, and I did too. Absolutely. I, 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 I was, I was posting literally two minutes after it happened. So I'm just, you know, the, the, I'm not talking down to anybody. I'm, I'm right there in the, in the gutter with you, but, but so we, you know, we do this to ourselves. So in that sense, but in the sense of like, you know, someone consciously attacking others for their energy. It's not that rampant. It does happen. Happens more often with some spirits. Um, and it's really pretty simple to deal with through amulets, through shielding, through, through just having a strong spiritual authority. Um, and you know, the thing is, once you really become like a great source of energy, you can even just like, you can feel something drawing on you and just be like, fuck it. I don't care. You know, like maybe it'll, maybe it'll help me out later. Like, <laughs> you know, like, so it'll be my little magical Renfield, uh, you know, that, that was, I think that was Dracula's like guy, right. His butler. But um, so, you know, there's that. Uh, but yeah, so I think that was the question. Yeah, I think that answered it quite well, actually. And so then the best for last, because you actually do cover this in your book. So it stays on topic a little bit more. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so another person who is new to spirit work and they're asking are pacts a real thing do i have to worry about getting into pacts with demons if i'm going to start working with them and what are the do's and the do nots if pacts really are a real thing do i have to sell my soul <laughs> <laughs> so um i hate to say it but the but demons and the devil are way less interested in your soul than you have been led to believe. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, my, I, I knew a guy, Bill Siebert, Alobar, 
in fact, his his whole like body of work was just recently published by uh, friends of his that that are friends of mine as well. Um, and he passed, but I used to carry around something that he made, which was a title deed to immortal soul. It was this. It was on legal document and. It was so, it was great. It was long, it covered like copying of a soul and like, you know, just every legalistic parameter. It was, it was wonderful. Um, so, you know, hail to Alobar, wherever he is. Um, he has, you know, passed now, but he, he COVID related, but um, it's, it pacts are real. Sure. I mean, I made a pact to be on the show, right? Like I'm going to be on the show. Here's my book. What do I expect to get out of it? Well, hopefully some of you bastards will buy my book. <laughs> <laughs> and some of you will be mad at me because I just called you bastards, but um, no, you know, it's a term of endearment, but you know, some of you people, you know, so that's the pact. So are pacts with demons real? Absolutely. I have a long-standing pact with Astaroth that I made when I was super young, really, a teenager. Um, what did Astaroth want in exchange? Some offerings. Um, this is, you know, this is a wonderful thing about arbitrage, spiritual arbitrage. Um, so, you know, when we talk about like geo arbitrage, for instance, maybe we get someone from a country with a depressed economy who is willing to produce like, I don't know, digital art or something, or, you know, to send somebody in Brazil and I, you know, they have these awesome witch markets. So I want them to send me something that I can't get here. And so they will go and they'll buy me the thing and they'll ship the thing and it will cost them a fraction of something that I have here. So what I end up giving them in exchange, be it one of my courses or just cash might be two to three times what they've paid in Brazil, right? So it's worth it to them and it's worth it to me because I can't get it at all here. Well, that's how it is with spirits and with pacts. We're in bodies. We can offer them things that they don't normally get. Offerings, incense, wine, libations, food, praises, even, you know, to some extent, attention, heat, these kinds of things are pleasurable and unavailable to them in exchange for which we get influence on things that we can't easily influence because we are in bodies, right? We can't, we can be here in the place we're at in a really tangible way. I can pick this up and I can drop it. That's really impressive, but I can't like pick up the, I actually think you're on like a fake Zoom background, but if it was a real room, my room is real, damn it. <laughs> um, We're not as cool as you yet. No, your rooms, your rooms Our are backgrounds are bad. Always, like, I'm, it always takes me like 10 minutes to figure out like if somebody's using a Zoom background or do they just have this really like super occult looking house. But, um, so like if I could go and like, I can't pick up the jars in your house from here, whereas a spirit can influence things. So they don't, they can't necessarily pick things up and drop them, but they can nudge probability. They can influence minds. And so that's, that's the pact. That's the trade-off. Your pacts don't have to last forever. They don't have to be lifelong pacts. And the other thing is you can dissolve pacts. You can call upon your spiritual authority and say this pact is null and void. 
there are people out there who are like, you know, well, I'm who have come to me and said, you know, I made this unwise pact where I promised my soul in exchange for, uh, you know, twenty million dollars and never having to work again, and and now I'm really worried because I I don't want to go to and lose my soul, and I'll be like did you get $20 million? And they'd be like, no. And I'm like, okay, then no problem. <laughs> like, you know, pack <laughs> null and void. Um, you know, did, maybe you didn't specify, maybe you're thinking, well, over the course of my life, I might make $20 million, which is not unreasonable. But, um, you know, you just unwind it, say, no, 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 this, this is no law. And then, yeah, you might get pushback. You might get cross conditions and then that's when you have to do the exorcism invoke the spiritual authority um that's you know that's where the conflict happens so get jason's protection book <laughs> get the protection book but but you know the thing is there is no such thing as foolproof security anywhere like there's no security professional that will say there is no way that anyone can attack this embassy because somebody can always find a way to attack the embassy even if absolutely it's, you know, just driving um and it's like that with spirits too but people don't want to hear that they want to hear well is this either perilously dangerous and or is it absolutely safe and the answer to both of those is no it's not perilously dangerous nor is it absolutely safe and in that it is like every other damn thing in your life skiing i live in a ski town not perilously dangerous not perfectly safe absolutely just like driving the car, like you said earlier. <laughs> like driving the car. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on today, Jason. That was absolutely fantastic. And I'm sure that our viewers will get some great nuggets of wisdom out of that. And it was a pleasure to have you here. Um, oh, so it's a pleasure to be here. It's so nice to see your face. And, 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 you know, for those that I just have to say, for those that there's, there's a, seals of the four kings and in the book i i lay out like you can make a circle out of pretty much whatever you want and then you can put seals of the four kings at the four directions and who did i turn to to make me those you know those seals <laughs> so uh, you know, if you read the book and you want to experiment, I think they'll be up in your store, right? Yep, for sure. We were uh, planning to release them just in time for your book to come out, actually. So we'll be offering them in wood and in uh, slate stone. So, oh, I need the slate stone ones now. See, <laughs> I'll be I'll be ordering them, and, and that, you know, and they'll be. I mean, not to I not I'm not going to mention anybody else, but but to advertise, but that you know there are other people that do things like this too. So I'm sure they'll be popping up in the UK and, you know, in the, the Southern United States and so on. So, um, you know, yep, for sure. yeah, support there your local witch shop. For that can everyone. Help you. Yeah. Yes. There's, there's enough for everyone. I'm, I'm all about like, supporting everybody. So for sure. So everybody consorting with spirits, it's coming out, I believe the beginning of next month, or is it this month? Yeah, May the 1st. Yeah, so May 1st, the book is released. Check it out. It'll be available on Amazon. It'll be available here through North Witch or pretty much anywhere else that carries books. So check that out. And thank you for coming on today, Jason. That was oh, thank fantastic. Thank you for having me. So great meeting you, having you here. Oh, it was great you meeting so you too, Sandra. So much.